FMS is your baseline. The functional movement screen is an objective tool that measures seven fundamental movements that are key to daily life and determines if those movement patterns are optimal, acceptable, or dysfunctional. While the screen is simple and efficient to perform, each test has been strategically selected due to the significant feedback it provides on mobility, stability, and how both work together for larger integrated functional movements. Based on the screen results, FMS professionals can then prioritize exercise and programming to accommodate their clients' needs so they can achieve higher levels of fitness and performance. This highly customized exercise selection protects clients from factors that inhibit progress and produces self-aware clients and athletes who can now reach greater heights in lifelong movement health and vitality. Whether your focus is optimizing training, maximizing client retention, or enhancing communication, the screen helps you get there. It is the foundation for one of our basic beliefs. Play to your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Explore our course options and get started today. Endorphins work whether you do good technique or bad technique because you do hit that that cardiovascular stimulation, that that deeper breathing. But when people look at their cardiovascular ranges, depending on what kind of monitoring device you do, most people try to run in that mid range. And the very first time I went minimalist shoe and said I'm going to run in my lowest cardio range, and you know it's easy, 180 minus your age is going to put me you know around 130 or something like that. I went out running and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just ran a 14 minute mile. That sucks. But I was coming off my neck surgery and I'm like, but it didn't hurt. And I think I can go another mile. And the very first time I listened to my body, I ran four miles without discomfort and without pain. And I didn't listen to music. It was almost, I found my slot and I've always loved paddleboarding. When I look at my heart rate paddleboarding, no matter how hard I hit it, I stay in a really low cardio range, which is almost empowering. And you don't hurt the next day. And so I said, even though this is a disrespectful running cadence and time and everything, I actually enjoyed running. And so I, I taught myself how to run after my neck surgery, just because so many other forms of exercise weren't an option. Cycling put me in a bad posture and I couldn't do anything with a kettlebell. So I just started walking, but I just leaned forward a little bit. And it, I, it looks like an old man shuffle, but if you look at barefoot runners, they have this nice... Nobody wants to see you run. I, and I that's can, why I do I it in the woods. I can guarantee that. <laughs> that's why I do it in the woods, man. It's nobody's <laughs> business how I run. There's things we do in, in boot camp that test you, but what got you here won't keep you here. So we will test drive you every now and then. We will push you to that limit, but we don't have to do that every day, nor is it in your best interest. Now, there's a point where you got to prove yourself, but once you're on the other side of that, we spend way more time tuning race cars than we do racing race cars, and people don't get that. Race cars do not stress themselves every day. They stress themselves at competition, and they're tuned and tweaked every day in between there. Changing the way someone moves is probably one of the most rewarding things you could ever do, whether it's in a rehabilitation situation, sports or fitness, or just helping your child learn something new. It's not as simple as finding a problem and assigning an exercise. If you look at the physical landscape of the way we moved 40, 50, 60 years ago compared to now, we've got way more science, way more instruction, and way more professionals helping, and we're moving worse. Exercise does not change movement like you think. You can have good and bad experiences in exercise. Therefore, it is the way you pick an exercise that sets up the way movement changes or doesn't change. But the first time you started movement, nobody coached you. You went through a very natural and authentic process driven by your own DNA and need to explore your environment. But something sets you off the path. An illness, a disease, an anatomical problem, and from now on, you see and feel things differently than you should. 
Can you imagine taking somebody who's colorblind to a museum and hoping they can appreciate art? Or taking somebody who's tone deaf to a concert and hoping they can appreciate what you do? I think it's important for us to all realize that perception drives behavior. What if I could put you back through the same sequence at which you learned to move the first time and not give you the answer but line you up so you would stumble upon it in a matter of seconds? We want to go deeper into the perspective of movement as a behavior. We've got to measure each step of the way so we can gauge our effectiveness at changing movement. Exercise is not how you change movement. It can be a vehicle and a tool, but changing movement is a little bit deeper and a little bit messier. I'd like to clean it up for you and show you a simple recipe that will make you never look at exercise or movement the same way again. that's how you can get away with staying out all night and still going out and having a great game because you had enough in reserve and that's because you, you did some good training but eventually there's not enough cryo tanks in the world for you to make up for the fact that your tanks are just empty and so understanding that we can rob a little from this bucket to fill this one is getting them to understand the connection between everything getting them to understand the connection where they might not have made that realization one of the biggest things i have with my my college and pro athletes is is when they do get into using like a whoop strap or something like that when they see their score the morning after they they, they had some drinks the night before and they just see how the recovery crashes and they might have known it on a surface level, but not having that, that, that real connection with it and saying, wow, I didn't realize how much that set me back and lost me an opportunity to get better. And then I joke with them. I said, you know, one of the things you'll never hear in your life is, is hey, man, you look awesome. You've been drinking. <laughs> Balance is a subconscious thing. You just tapped into the subconscious mind with something you did. Almost everything coming off this frame the rest of the day is going to run a little bit better and a little bit cleaner and seem a little stronger and fitter, but only because you gave them what we call that motor control, that reset. The professional athlete comes in, they don't really care what their motor control screen is. They want to know how do I run faster, jump higher, you know, do all those, those sorts of things. But when I can correlate to a pitcher that this is the framework, this is the, the foundation everything is going to go off of from your consistency to your force production, you know, that you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. And so you start picking that foot up and start your delivery. If everything falls apart underneath you, I don't care how many, you know, weighted ball drills or, or, or how many different body blade drills you do, you can't get the energy from the ground. And this is one of the, the lead culprits of it. And ironically, it's also of all our movement testing that we do, it's one of the highest correlations with, with arm and elbow. And feedback means you've set a baseline and the feedback is letting you know are you improving? Are you making that baseline that you set through some type of testing, obviously movement screening, but any type of test for that matter, strength testing, power testing, are you achieving that goal? Are you making yourself better? You've got to have some feedback. You and I have found the same thing. We've worked with the highest end people in the world. We found small overlooked mobility and stability or general physical problems that were actually eroding their ability to do their thing. They're saying the exact same thing and I think it's good, but here's what they said. We've got to do a couple of workouts to find those. All I ever said is, if I think somebody's a drunk driver, I'm going to administer test. We're not going to do a few laps around the block to see <laughs> right. if you're too drunk to drive. Yeah. And that's the problem. If we've got somebody we suspect this with, it, it's getting too risky to even run those two exercise sessions.
Hello everyone and welcome to this FMS YouTube live event. I'm Ashley Forbes and I wanted to remind you if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel and click that notification bell so you get all future notifications. We will also be taking questions today during the presentation, so please submit those below in the chat box and we will be sending them back over to Gray and Lee to answer at the end of the presentation. All right, without any further delay, let's kick it over to the FMS studios where Gray and Lee are waiting. Hey, um, we got a pretty exciting topic today we want to get into, something that we think is pretty timely, Gray. Um, everybody kind of getting over the cobwebs of uh, really the chaos that was 2020. Um, a lot of what we know in 2020 is is you got to get into work, got to work out, you got to exercise, you got to start moving. Um, and certainly the, the new year is when a lot of people start trying to take off and do that. But I think we got to think a little differently now with everything that you and I've learned over the years um, through research and, and of course getting feedback is we need to think a little differently how we kind of get started because what's the other thing we also know when people start working out probably about two or three months later they end up in the uh, clinic because they get hurt so we got to think a little differently right no and, and I, I think you you bring a valid point not everybody who tries to work out without safety or instruction gets hurt but they also don't achieve their goals so they just give up so usually people quit for one of two reasons it's not working or they get hurt and both of these things may can be explained and and there are things we can do and so we we put this this title out but actually lee put me on this journey two years ago he asked me to do a couple of videos called a common sense approach to movement which literally is talking about movement function without mentioning the fms because that is our baby that's our tool that's our measuring stick but we have no illusions that 20 years from now we won't have a better way to gauge movement and and movement behavior and look at it in an intelligent way but i did those two talks and within that time one of our other partners, Kyle Kiesel, really gave us a clean perspective of a huge body of work on looking at risk factors for musculoskeletal injury. So we used to be in a time when as long as your doctor said you're okay to exercise, you're probably not going to have a heart attack with exertion or activity. Now we're actually more worried about a musculoskeletal episode than a metabolic episode because most people can't even move well enough to get into the big metabolism, but they're going to probably have an episode beforehand. And right now, musculoskeletal health is becoming just as much of a problem for almost everybody as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and it's kind of the yin and yang. You need to work out and exercise to avoid some of those other health-related issues, but those health-related issues create musculoskeletal health problems and create you not to work out. So it's a vicious cycle that a lot of us are in as professionals, but our, certainly our clients and our patients are in, that we got to have a, a new way of looking at how to break that cycle. We, we started this journey working in a clinic with Kyle, sizing up patients, athletes, and clients every day and realizing that these people have the same goal, but they're not starting at the same place. And even though we all intuitively knew this client's going to take a long time, this patient's going to be complicated, this guy's going to do well, we didn't have a clear way to talk about that or measure that. And so when I did that common sense approach to movement, I showed you where that functional layer really gives us a direction and clarity. And we didn't know what we were doing. We were just taking a sample that wasn't being taken. Physical therapists were great with local uh, biomechanical assessment, chiropractors, ATCs right there on the local. We had good strength coaches and trainers working these functional movement patterns, and we were still losing people in between. And there's an area that, that I think we got uh, really good real estate to talk about. So, you know, is your client, is your patient, is your athlete ready? How do you know? Because the state of readiness of the person in front of you is just as important as the program, protocol, or problem-solving uh, workout you just put together. So where you hear me start talking about movement wellness, a big component of movement wellness is owning your functional movement. And, and I think we're going to uncover this topic where if you've been through exercise science in college or anything to do with health uh, and fitness, you've heard the word wellness 
But I literally think unless we redefine it, we're not going to move the bar any further. And yet by redefining it, I think we all will get a piece of clarity that that I've received in the last two years. You told me to simplify it. And Kyle said, look for these things first. Well, if you take those those two things, these these are binary. It's yes, no. Are you hypertensive or not? It, what's your, you know, what are you, is your BMI within normal limits or not? We can answer these questions. And as long as those uh, things keep stacking up, we can use that to program you. And one other thing, everything I'm getting ready to tell you guys is not a lecture you got to give to your client. What looks like a functional workout, a wellness workout, a really tight thing to correct somebody feels like fitness to them. Let it be called fitness. You just got a few other gauges to watch. So we're not changing equipment or anything like that. We're changing supervision. We're changing metrics and we're changing responsibility. Well, I mean, it's been on our tagline for going on 20 years now, move well, then move often. And I think what we've learned over the last, you know, 10 years in looking at a lot of the data, looking at a lot of the research, getting more feedback from other individuals is that moving well takes more than just looking at movement. We have to have some other considerations um, as part of this whole movement wellness definition. And having taught side by side with, with you guys for feels like 20 years now, it's it feels it's, a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Sunday afternoon in an airport is where it feels the longest. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's a labor of love. But it's it, when we when we see people, even in our movement screening workshops, that think they move better than they do or worse than they do, we realize the first part of this journey for a large percentage of people is awareness. And when you gauge your movement correctives and when you gauge your movement screens and tests and assessment to help people become aware before you tell them what the problem is the buy-in is so much better but let's let's take this right to where everybody's sitting right now you're going to be asked to do probably three things in the first quarter of this new year people's lifestyles change drastically some people may have known what to do and are going to emerge from this cave fitter Many people won't, and they'll accumulate risk factors. And and the the risk factors I'm talking about, all I want you to think about is if you go to a physical and flunk a vital sign, the flip side of that penny is called a risk factor. Okay, so you've got something we need to watch way more than once a year right now, Lee. You get a physical, you're hypertensive, and you have elevated body temperature. I want to see you tomorrow. I want to run some tests. If you're good to go. That's great, but you weren't issued a clean slate for musculoskeletal wellness. That means if you go into exercise consuming whatever YouTube is playing is the most popular thing for today, there's a good chance you're not going to meet your goal, and there's also a chance within that it could be because you have a really bad experience, something tweaks, something hurts. And uh, anyway, I want to get healthy. I want to get fit. I want to get lean. These three things are going to be a revolving statement that people want to do. And if you don't deliver these things within a, a safe and progressive way, you're going to lose business. And so many of us clinicians, chiropractors, physical therapists, athletic trainers working in a clinical environment have one foot in wellness because we have these gyms, these facilities right next to our clinic. And we know when we have to just discharge them due to insurance, they are not ready for the wild west of fitness because we don't know what they're going to consume. And we can't assume that every trainer or coach is going to be aware of these things or screening the same way. So I mean, we, there's a big, there's a big gap there, Greg. It's a huge gap. At. There's a huge gap from discharging a, a patient from let's say back pain or an ACL are they ready to go back to playing golf or are they ready to go back to playing tennis and a lot of them aren't they just know they just don't need a clinician they don't need that input and again what's one of the risk factors you're talking about a previous injury yes one of the most consistent risk factors so they go in and then they they feel like okay I feel good I'm ready but you're not ready to go back to maybe what you were doing prior to that so there's a gap that has to be considered before they're ready to go step back on the field of court yeah. Uh, and, and that's and, an opportunity. No, it, it is. Here's a t-shirt for you. Asymmetrical doesn't mean, fun a, 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 asymptomatic doesn't mean functional. Okay. So just because your back doesn't hurt doesn't mean your back 
is free of risk. And, and that's one thing I think we can all own as clinicians because, you know, we, a lot of times we see these mistakes in exercise, but I'm not blaming the trainer. We got a lot of therapists that didn't have time to get you well, but should have also formed you, informed you that you weren't well. And, and you can easily consume fitness, but it's going to be a very narrow path and it's going to have some guardrails on it. You get outside of those guardrails, I can't promise you anything. So. Yeah, and these three people you have up here, these three are typical, whether they just got discharged from a a clinician or whether they're walking in the door to your fitness facility. These three people are your typical individuals who want to maybe look good, who want to feel good, who want to perform a little better. Yeah, and and so let me take these three examples that one of or all three of these should be relevant for each one of us, whatever we're we're doing and 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 we've both functioned in multiple roles. I've been a coach, I've been a trainer, I've been a clinician, and most recently I've been a PE teacher. But everything I'm getting ready to say very much applies to program design when you're working with people who think they're weller than they are (laughs) you know you you passed your physical but that doesn't mean you're ready you're ready for what you just watched in the last uh crossfit games so the a a good statement we can we can throw out there and i think it's well-intentioned every one of those people asking for to be healthy fit or lean part of their agenda involves moving more I need to start exercising. And so they're going to add activity to their life. They're going to consume it probably in an indiscriminate way with very little education and a lot of marketing. Well, and that's the problem right now. I think that's that's what we're talking about. And that leads us into the rest of the conversation today, Gray, is if you go to a physician, you go to most people. You said marketing. Most people know that in order for me to be more healthy, in order for me to feel better, exercise has to be part of that recipe. We realize most people know they need to eat better. And I think there's so much information about eating and nutrition. But when exercise, it comes around, what do people do? They just start walking. They go to the gym. They don't know what to do. They don't have an idea of where do they need to start? What do I need to do to make myself feel better and accomplish my goals? As you said, they go to the internet. They go talk to their friends. They go back to what they were doing in high school. And that's their workout. Best advice I ever heard is uh, guys like, I need to start going to the gym. How far away from your house is the gym? About a mile and a half. Why don't you just walk there, slap the glass, and walk home for a month and see how that's working for you. Walk faster every day. and <laughs> Because it's, it's literally, I think the, the, the low-hanging fruit here is none of us have an excuse not to walk more. And if you're walking and you have a lot of mobility and stability issues, you could compound those, but not nearly as quick as you will spinning a bike or running up a hill. So if you're doing a little bit of corrective and a little bit of walking and you give yourself about four to six weeks to just get into a different slot, you you would be ready for significantly more activity and more varied activity, but you don't get exercise entertainment right now. You don't have a big enough bandwidth. But why don't people continue to exercise? Because that's part, that's a, in my opinion, one of the biggest issues. They'll start right now. We're, a lot of people are getting ready to start their program for the things we just mentioned. They want to be healthy. They want to feel good. They want to look good. But then they stop exercising. They get right back. So the main reason is one, they're not accomplishing the goals. They've been doing this for three months and I look the same and I kind of feel the same or they get hurt. Yeah. And, and so most people are having an exercise conversation with a professional, with a clinician, with a coach for a health or physical conditioning reason. Now, what we're looking at is a 10-year linear increase in exercise-related injuries. And, and, and we've seen that go up. And if we saw any other health metric, okay, cancer go up or, or a food exposure go up, we would be on that. But we just turn away because we still know exercise is good for you, and we're all shamed by results. I mean, if, if part of your profession has something to do with movement, we are part of the problem. We're not just sitting here pointing fingers at people who are, you know, motor morons or can't move. They have come through a life that said, we'll pay you more to sit than stand. And they're trying to get on the other side of that, and we should be an ambassador of that. But just like you said, the best way to get people to comply with an exercise or a behavior change or a lifestyle change is to show them the results. And if they can't feel the results, you need to be measuring them first. And if I can measure a change, I promise you'll be feeling it. So the solution is to exercise more. But the problem right now that we have that this data tells us 
Is it exercising more is, in essence, leads you to more injuries? Or is a risk factor in itself? A risk factor for injury is exercise, and that's one reason so many people don't continue to exercise. And the one thing about this stat that's that's great, and you and I have talked about this, is it's not that they're going in and dropping something on their foot or they're going in and using some equipment. These are body weight. These are just general people going in and getting hurt during exercise and going to the ER. It's what these is yep. what this data was telling us. Yeah, body weight, not just weight training, not just high end stuff. And and you know, I could say it. I could say this another way, Lee. There's a lot of good general dietary advice out there right now, but if I'm dependent on insulin as a diabetic, that doesn't apply to me. And so most diabetics know I can't go on a crash diet. I can't intermittent fast like I read in general articles. I've got to watch this. That's how somebody who has poor balance, poor mobility, poor stability, poor core control, poor body awareness, poor proprioception is. The only difference is they don't know they're a movement diabetic. And so there are going to be some things. Just like if you start messing with a diabetic's diet and don't look at the look at a few more gauges you can make things worse even though everything you're saying is generally right it is specifically wrong so that you know i want to i want us to get there and i really want us to embrace the word wellness because i sort of laugh at that word because it's never been clearly defined it's like health light or fitness light it's it's not as invasive as health care and it's not as hard as fitness outside of that most of us couldn't give a half hour lecture on how wellness is different than health or fitness. And yet I think it's the linchpin. So I wanted to sort of prime the pump of the way you guys think and your imagination and see that the word function we've been doing applies as much to wellness as it does health or fitness. So, you know, they already know what they want. How do you decide what they need? Are their wants or needs driving your next decision? And and we can give somebody everything they ask for because I can take you right to a lean program. I can do a program just to get you generally healthy. I can really pick it up and up your fitness. But are you a movement diabetic or not? Do you have these risk factors? And that's what I that's what I want to go into because the functional language that we've been obsessing on for a while. Like I said, the FMS is not a screening tool. It's a communication device. And if you screen somebody and they perform poorly but think they move well, we've got a chance to actually keep them from hitting the wall that we know they're aiming right at and and really you know, facilitate their goals in the first place. So the, the one thing I want you guys to hear is we're always talking about the responsibility of injury risk. What I want you guys to really hear from this is a competitive advantage. Trainers and, and clinicians and coaches that embrace the concept that we're getting ready to go a little bit deeper in will actually get quicker, better, more sustainable results, and they'll be safer. So I want to shop the business opportunity to really help people achieve goals that the current trends well, it's have retention. not given. At yeah. the end of the day, it's about retention. It's it about is. putting someone on the right path as early as possible so that you don't have these significant roadblocks or have a dead end that you're continuing to. you got to start them at the right place, meet them where they are. And the key thing here is to create that awareness because the awareness, the, again, the first step is to realize you have a problem. The second step is to create some behavioral change. And I think that's where you get the buy-in. I, I was listening to a really good book uh, called 10% Happier. And it's really about how the Western world consumes meditation. And the one takeaway, the scientific takeaway of people who start doing some form of meditation is you don't wind up floating on a cloud and you don't wind up being this perfectly Zen person. You simply are aware of that voice in your head that's sometimes not your best friend. And just being aware of that, and you and I have seen it, the minute somebody's aware of an ankle mobility problem or a left rotation problem, they actually can talk back to you about it. Yeah, I've always wondered why I'm stiff to that side. It's not a problem anymore. It's just us sort of shopping the best remedy for that and the best lifestyle change is going to do that. But once they're aware of it, it's easy. And I think too many, too many of us, including myself, have told people about movement without letting them have that experience and hit that wall. And then turn around and say, all right, what do we do? And then you get that change and, and it's happening. So we're going to go into this. We know their wants, healthy, fit, and lean. But a practical awareness of wellness. And let me just say, when you hear me say wellness, I'm talking about adequate movement function 
and an appropriate state of readiness. And so we know lifestyle can compact that. We know dehydration and, and all this sleep and all these other things compact that. But movement is our wheelhouse, and that's a big part of this puzzle that I think a lot of people still to this day feel like movement screening is overkill because I'm going to watch them work out the whole time. And, and you know, once, once you've got experience, it's 10 minutes, but it's a wealth of knowledge, and you can really chart their progress just like you could if you knew their body comp or their bench press. You can sort of find this linear graph. So the one thing that, that I say to myself all the time is you should spend less time in programming mode. Quit trying to put this person in a category. Let the wellness diagnosis, let these risk factors, measurements, screens, tests, assessment – Put them where they are and use your brain for the creativity for this individual situation. So don't try to guess what category they're in. It's it's way too quick and efficient just to measure the category they're in. And when then, you say category, what do you mean by category? Well, you're talking like programming category, like strength. Yeah. Let's say let's say I, let's say I put somebody through a movement screen and they have pain on three of the patterns. I actually consider them a healthcare problem. And if we've got a, a chiropractor, a PT next door, we're still exercising but I want them to have an SFMA and I want to know where are we working and where are we staying away from and do you think they need treatment or should we just watch this and do correctives for a month? That's a great way yeah, to play. Yeah, you basically segmenting them out to figure out what, where is their biggest. Again, part of what we have to do when we look at, again, where people get a little frustrated, to be honest, Gray, with kind of how we approach things is we take a lot more time up front to profile this individual, figure out what do they really need. They're not going to have any problem telling us what they want. Right? That's right. But we have to figure out what they need. And to be honest, that's resourcefulness. Because if, if you look at me and you tell me, Lee, this is exactly what you need to focus on, that may be going in, like as you say, go to the chiropractor, go wherever. But that's the opportunity. That's the number one thing you want me focusing on right now, today, tomorrow, and maybe the next week until that changes. No, and that's, that's resourceful. Because now, if, if you put me on the right path now, then – Three weeks from now, you're going to clean up a lot of stuff That's right. over that three weeks. That's right. And one of the things we've learned is people get frustrated when they movement screen or do an SFMA or because they find so many problems. But what we've tried to do is scale both of these systems to show you, here's the weakest link, here's the driver. And many times, if you will just focus here and listen to the rules associated with this, the natural movement learning faculties will, will go. And the one thing that, that is really revealing to me about the way that some of the evolution. Well, hold on. Well, you said, I know I interrupted you there. You said natural learning faculties. What you really mean is if you tap on the right thing, you reset the right thing, and whether that's getting you to drink more water, whether that's getting you to sleep better, whether that's improving your movement screen, whichever one of those three things I just mentioned, which one of those three things is out and you make it better can impact everything else. You got it. Anything that makes your heart rate variability more appropriate to the situation and your respiration more appropriate to the situation, the way you breathe in meditation is not the way you breathe in kettlebell swings or the way you breathe in yoga. Three completely different things. But that awareness of, oh, I have all these resources. I can breathe better. I can shift my weight. These come to people when they go through these movement correctives and they don't come in day one. Now we show the toe touch progression on stage and make a miracle, you know, for, for showmanship. But the point is you want to sand that board really slow and it'll be smooth in a month. And you won't believe the reserve people have to go express their self in more robust ways with exercise. Um, but one of the things I, I wanted to say is we, we appreciate, um, oops, slides not advancing. There we go. We had a huge delay. Operator error, I'm sure. Yeah, but anyway, I'm scared to press it again. Uh, when we don't have wellness, what we end up with is this ping pong of people get healthy, they try to get fit, they get an injury, they have a bad experience. For some reason, they get off the wagon, they get unhealthy again, and they rush right over to fitness. So it's that line between health and fitness that people cross way too many times. We should establish a robust state of health and lifestyle that allows you to meet fitness where you do. And that's where I think the word wellness may have not even been necessary before because we could go back 100 years, almost every human being was walking two and three miles a day, not for fitness, just 
for transportation. Uh, that's not happening anymore. And it's that minimum effective dose that keeps you moving every day that we've, we've ceased to do. And we've tried to redose that. Well, the thing we find out about pharmaceuticals is if you've got a severe problem, we got to get the dosage right. Because the same medi med medication that can cure you can kill you. So if you're using exercise for rehabilitation, you better have good precision in the way you prescribe that exercise. If you're using exercise as a corrective measure, you better have some baseline to see if the quality is changing even when they haven't warmed up. That means they're, they're responding better. And if you're using exercise for fitness, you need conditioning metrics. And to me, the precision must be better the deeper you go into the problem. So exercise is medicine, but why don't we treat it like medicine? I don't just go to your medicine cabinet and grab the four, four pills that you're taking, but yet when we talk about exercise, it's that same perception all the way down. And, and the deeper your problems are, the more we've got to customize. Um, so I'll just keep pressing the button here. There we go. Okay. With actionable wellness, what we see is we take that line between health and fitness and, and we really broaden that area. This is where movement screening has always existed for me. People come to fitness and we don't know if they got a health problem, a wellness problem, or a fitness problem. And when I say wellness, I'm, I didn't do that. We got a huge delay here. Sorry about that, guys. Well, when you mean actionable wellness, well, you, really when you say actionable, you mean things that we can impact. Yeah. You mean things that we can actually d deal with. Um, so when we talk, and when you say risk factors, Gray, these things are what you're talking about. Yeah, this, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And so when I say actionable wellness, there's, a, there's not a lot I can do about your body comp today. Right. We can do a lot about your sleep, your hydration, maybe even the way you're consuming food and the way that you perceive exercise. We can change a lot of that today, and a lot of that stuff is measurable. So when people come to the movement screen, some people get kicked to health because they actually provoked symptoms. They had pain in two of those patterns. Some people have a lot of dysfunction. They score a lot of ones on the movement screen. We want you to be fit, and you will be, but we got to stay right here and remove some of these mobility and stability barriers that are really going to distort your learning of how to be fit. You cannot adapt when you have that many dysfunctions, just like I can't expect you to learn music if you got wax in your ear. So there's going to be a delay there. So, yeah, go but for part, it. But part of what you we have to also understand when we start talking about health, movement wellness is, is the term you're talking about. Is it what can impact those things? And you mentioned them, but we can't underestimate their impact. Are those other behavioral factors like lifestyle issues? Like you said, body comp, sleep, hydrate, stress being a big factor right now that's impacting. If you're really has a, have a lot of stress in your life, it's going to impact your movement. And we know that's another risk factor that we have to deal with. You may not be able to change that one today. And that's what you mean by actionable things that we can impact today that we can put you on the right path. But if you're not addressing some of those other lifestyle issues, don't expect the things that we change today to stick. Exactly. And, and when we see people who have big movement issues, we find a few things. They're really not as aware of them as we wish they were. They don't understand left-right asymmetry, but the minute they become aware of that, they start giving you more information about how they, how they got there. But it's very hard for them to self-regulate movement when they have so many disadvantages. Yet, here's the funny thing. When they go through a proper corrective strategy, which is it, it doesn't even look like exercise to most people, but to the person who's got those barriers, it's, it's fatiguing enough to allow them to dump tension and actually feel a little bit better. And that's about all they can do. And, and if they want to get after it, they still can, but it's going to be three weeks from now. And, and I think we can all learn the art of engaging people in their corrective to the point where they actually feel like they're doing something. I think Alan Cosgrove has done a heck of a job with that. And, and a lot of other people have turned correctives into something that just looks like fitness. And they don't overinflate this whole approach. They simply just say, yeah, your fitness starts here. But they're watching wellness parameters, which we're going to talk about. Right. So we start talking about this whole idea of putting you, going back, putting you on the right path. Are they ready? 
Well, the first thing we got to make sure is that we check the box on the basic vital signs and basic health risk factors, making sure, as you said, the first thing that before you enter an exercise program, first question is, have you been released by a physician? And the, what that really means is, are you healthy to walk into the weight room or fitness or gym to, to do certain things? And I think that is kind of check the box of the, a lot of the typical vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. And right now, everybody gets their temperature checked before they walk into an office. Exactly. So let's just, let's just talk about the four categories of vital signs most of us will see if we go for a well physical with a medical uh, person. Uh, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and temperature. And if one of these things is a long way from normal, then we consider you at risk now compared to somebody who doesn't have that. And if you have three out of four of these things, there's a compounding effect. It's not three times worse. It's about eight times worse. So what we've got is vital signs for your health, and they are compounding. Having problems with all four is the worst case scenario. All right, so move forward. Now, if we look at musculoskeletal health, okay, this is your musculoskeletal risk factors. This means you're going to have an orthopedic episode, back, arthritic flare-up. And the thing is, we're not trying to predict the location of your body. We're just saying if you're using your body this wrong often, it's probably going to break down before any of your goals happen or anything else does. So the four categories we're looking at are balance, body comp, fundamental movement patterns, basic strength, basic flexibility. But the key thing you've got right there, Gray, is actionable. And I think that's important because, again, let's not underestimate the impact some of these behavioral things will have. And I think that's the piece that we've combined at this point. Understanding that your stress, your, your behavior, your body comp, things that we have to consider plus these movements this balance, the fundamental movements, the basic strength, flexibility, those things combined, just like those vital signs you mentioned combined, are those multiple things that we're looking at, factors, are what impact your musculoskeletal health. So any one or any combination of those are what create problems with your musculoskeletal health. I agree. And I think the reason body comp made it into this list is not just because of the biomechanical reason that people carrying excess weight are going to have more stress on their muscles and joints. That's obvious. That's freshman 101 exercise science. But poor body composition reveals probably some really poor lifestyle choices over time. Okay? So of all those things up there, balanced body comp, movement patterns, basic strength, flexibility, the one that's least actionable with exercise is body comp. Because most people who have a body comp problem, if you look at their rest and regeneration, meaning if you look at their nutrition, their sleep, their hydration, you're going to see some improvements right there. So let that suggestion live. That's the lifestyle recommendation. Now, can we work on balance today? Absolutely. But we're not going to try to work on balance so hard that you drop weight or burn calories doing it. We're going to try to clean up your lifestyle to let your body comp uh happen as naturally as possible. And by the time you're ready to exercise, we will have removed the mobility, stability problems, the asymmetries, and some of those things that are going to really make fitness uh, more challenging for you than it needs to be. So let's go back to our, our clients right here, our, 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 our people we're working with, and look at these three statements. I want to get healthy, fit, and lean. All right, let's go. All right. This is my first guy, and, and let me tell you a little bit of backstory about him. Had a hernia, all right, like most of us <laughs> end up with for our 40th or 50th birthday. Uh, anyway, um, guy doesn't exercise, but he's very active, and I, and I think we need to consider that. He plays golf at, at will, and he loves pickup basketball at least once a week. And even though his doctor has cleared him from a physical and his surgeon has released him from his hernia, he goes, I don't want to cut. I don't want to sprint. I don't want to do anything. And if I swing any harder than 60%, I think I'm going to pull something. This is a guy who's saying, I want to get back to basketball and golf. His doctor said he's ready to exercise, but he already told you, I can't play basketball and golf is scaring me a little bit. When we go into some simple test and, and you know, we can go deep into balance with the Y balance test or we can do single leg stance. It doesn't matter how you're finding these problems. If you've got a baseline for balance, he just fell short. His body comp isn't bad. 
his fundamental movement patterns, and we can say the movement screen, but if he were coming out of rehab with physical therapy, I'd be working off SFMA and maybe enter, entering into the movement screen. Basic strength, uh, basic flexibility, not so bad, but he's got a few movement patterns he can't get in. And, you know, hernias are usually an asymmetrical problem. And if you've ever had a hernia, one lunge looks completely different than the other for a long time. And you habituate these patterns, you got to get rid of them. So what his program is going to look like is going to be completely different now that I know I probably shouldn't challenge balance too hard. He's below the cut in balance. And there are some functional positions that even though they are good for us, they're not good for him right so now. So overall, this this example is showing us that even though he is healthy right now, if we don't address these underlying issues, his musculoskeletal health will will deteriorate. So if he goes into the gym, he works out, or he has a trainer that's just having him do the traditional um, – basically meeting his goals, which are, I want to play golf, which then that means he's going to get a rotational program, right? Or I want to play basketball, which means he's going to get a power program. If these underlying things are not addressed properly, he's going to have a problem. And great. That's not your opinion or Lee's opinion. That's based off the research that has been done. And when we talk about musculoskeletal health, that's what we're talking about. And again, I'll say it again. I'll keep saying this. It's that behavioral aspect, lifestyle aspect. It's a combination of the factors you see with this guy. No, and, and here's here's one of those guys, and, and this is a great case study because he is aware that he's not what he used to be last year. And yet his physical just said, you're as healthy as you were last year. And his surgeon said, I release you. And I'm, I'm going to give the trainer some credit. I think almost any trainer could probably get him more fit and avoid some of his problems. Problem is, he's not going to wait. You need to be very strategic and very precise because if he's not playing golf in a month, he may keep training with you. He may not, but he's going to tell a lot of people how quick you got him there. So if he's not playing golf in a month, you're fired. If I haven't lost a pound in a month, you're fired. And if my balance isn't better in my golf swing, you know. Uh, and yeah, but he's not coming in to play to get his balance better. He's That's not. He's coming in so you can get him back on the golf course. You can get him back playing basketball. You can make him feel a little bit better. But again, these underlying things right here may not be problematic today, tomorrow, next week, three, four weeks, but they're going to they're gonna be a problem. The cool thing is, and this scenario has happened to me multiple times, when we test his balance, when we test his lunge and maybe his upper body mobility, we tell him the same thing he told us, different. Well, I can see exactly why swinging a golf club and cutting is, is going to bother you. These you're, you're missing a lot of the good – fluid movement patterns that would allow you not to compensate here. And the compensation is what's causing the extra stress. And that's where the buy-in comes in. Mm -hmm. So you want, I want to get you playing golf. I want to get you back to doing the things you want to do at a higher level. Wait, this is where we got to start. I spent more time assessing him, screening him, testing him, and less time convincing him of the exercises he needs to do. It's a wash. You could spend more time nagging him about doing their exercises or more time showing the relevance and the change that it creates. Hit the next one. Okay, now we got the runner. Yeah. Okay, she's successful at five k. We all kind of chuckle because we all know the runners coming in thinking they're healthy, but I've yeah we we've yet to see a lot of runners that are and are, don't have pain. And we use the runner as the myopic uh, fitness enthusiast, and I could say the same thing about cycler cyclists, swimmers, or even people weight training. You you find that your people who migrate to resistance probably lack the cardiovascular fitness that will help them age gracefully. And the people who are so much into cardiovascular fitness don't realize that their posture and uh, lean body mass is eroding because they're not doing any resistance work. She's a runner. She's running 5Ks. Because she's had the extra time on her hands, she's going half marathons and bold into marathons and thinking, I got the shoes. I got the tights. It's just a few more miles. Let's do it. And of course, her physical says she's good. We go into her musculoskeletal health. We still see the balance problem. And, and you'd be surprised how many runners have a balance problem when you look at balance through precision, uh, Y balance test or motor control screen just to get a... And especially right versus left. A lot of times it's an asymmetrical balance That's problem. exactly what I'm... Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, it's if you tell them balance on one leg, they'll always pick their favorite one first. Um, but we look at her body comp and her movement screen. Let's say her body comp is where she's supposed to be for her age and gender and her functional movement patterns are twos on everything. 
but you can still pull a two in in the FMS and still have some ankle issues and stuff like that. So she she's probably bracing her way through, but she flunked maybe ankle mobility. She flunked balance. So you know that's that's where we're at with her. So go ahead. And then we've got the guy who wants to lose some weight, and lo and behold, he checks out. He's healthy. His doctors clear him for exercise. His balance is good. His basic strength and flexibility is good. Obviously, he's here for body comp. That's a that's a non-issue. He's got a few movement patterns where he's not stable or not mobile. Not to the point where we can measure a lot of single joint tightness. He just doesn't move well deep into his squat, deep into his lunge. But yet, that's exactly where the exercise world's getting ready to take him. I'd rather know that ahead of time, preemptive strike. So when people move poorly... Moving more is no longer the answer. Um, and and I don't think it ever was the answer, but we never had this many people moving this poorly. And there's there's so many things to blame. All we got to do is acknowledge it and move forward. We, we've got a lot of reasons to sit, but, you know, we make more excuses every day. So. But I think one thing that we're tr- – the underlying thing, we're, message we're trying to get across today also, Gray, is that Yes, when people move poorly, but there's a lot of different reasons why people may move poorly. It, it could be because they've got some, some stress. It could be because their hydration. It could be a lot of those factors that are driving their poor movement patterns as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Go ahead, next slide. So let's just go. This is the way America is currently perceived statistically speaking 50 50 percent of americans report a musculoskeletal condition okay that's that's one out of every two people that's getting ready to meet you has something they're either talking to you about or not talking to you and about. it's not to the point where they got to go to the doctor not all of them nope. they nope. just know that they've got something going on yep uh 60 of americans live with a chronic disease 40 percent with two or more 72 percent of americans are obese or overweight Less than 5% of Americans participate in 30 minutes of daily activity. And the very first thing that they're going to do when they decide to consume exercise is see 30 minutes three times a week. That's, that's going from first gear to fifth gear pretty quick with no gears in between. Um, go ahead and advance. When asked to self-report, 81% of these exact same people believe they're in good or excellent health. And that's what's causing the problem, Gray. <laughs> yeah, right the there. Because people are going to go into the gym thinking they're ready to go, and they're going to break down. Yeah. So if if you're walking out of your front door to get the newspaper every morning and the guy who's your next door neighbor on your right has an oxygen bottle and the guy who lives to the left of you is morbidly obese, even though you're limping, you're like, well, I'm way healthier than these guys. And so it's all relative. You may not be ready, but compared to what you're you're immediately aware of, you're better than that. And that's how I think we all lull ourselves into this. And And I'll be the first one to tell you, I was coming out of a neck surgery as we were developing the fundamental capacity screen. And even though I was six months out of, out of neck surgery, when I did my standing long jump, uh, my feet didn't want to leave the ground. That I, 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 was, I was jumping at something that I would think most 70-year-olds could do, and it scared the heck out of me. And it wasn't that I didn't have the power to jump. My neck didn't want the landing. And so these people are going to be doing a lot of subconscious behaviors to protect themselves, just like they do a lot of subconscious behaviors to compensate incorrectly. So when we go straight into exercise with this kind of awareness, we're going to find problems before they get aware. I want them to be aware, and the problems don't even have to be exposed. So go ahead. All right. Well, musculoskeletal conditions. Lee, you've been sitting right with the researchers and also some of the providers. Sitting with the researchers, not a researcher. Right. <laughs> Let's but, make that clear. Yeah, yeah. You've been telling me what I've been they sitting, say. I've been sitting at the end going, I just, yeah. I just take it all in. As we tell everybody, he's not that kind of PhD. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, number one, chronic disability, leading contributor of disability worldwide, musculoskeletal conditions. And we know this in many different organized groups. Our, our initial uh, embrace was from the military and athletics at the professional and collegiate level. And it's not because we only enjoy working with the, the, the tip of the spear or the fittest people in the world. What we realized is in these environments, they're better stats. People aren't waiting for research. They're waiting for a competitive advantage. And as soon as you find a way for them to do things better, they do it. They adopt it. The early adopters are always at the tip of the spear. 
knowing that if we're missing something and we get it before anybody else, we got a competitive advantage. And what we found out in military populations, athletic populations, poor movers consume more resources. And I think that's where the conversation needs to start. It's not about injury prevention, injury risk, or anything. People who move poorly are going to take more time and energy away from the group effort than would be necessary if we were proactive. Well, and the other the other point, this this slide in the previous one where you talk about the data, the solution is always exercise more. That's the solution that's given to everybody. And we, we know now that that's part of the problem. Yeah. If we're not addressing the issues. And and as as long as more is preceded with well, it works. And the minute more is up front, it it doesn't work. Now if you if you're really into this, uh, we've got we've got the the data for you. But the the musculoskeletal research right now has about sixteen, maybe sixteen plus multifactorial uh, risks or, or or reasons that you would be at higher risk. And I think we've got to take that language of compounding. Having two of these is going to be is going to be bad. Having five of these is going to be exponentially worse. And yet I think when we start looking at them, these are things we've been talking about. Guys, don't be scared of these. These are the way they're aware of their problems, their past medical history, some lifestyle stuff, and basic mobility and stability. That's all we're talking about. But when you let too many of these things go unchecked, you've got a very risky situation, meaning not saying they're going to get injured, saying they're not going to hit their goal in a quick enough time to appreciate your service. Right. There's there's multiple things that you need to consider that make up your musculoskeletal health. That's really what, what you're saying is, and again, this has been through the research to say that these different things basically Go back one. combined or separate, but these multiple things are what allow you to be have good musculoskeletal health. And if one or more of those things are not at a certain level, they need to be addressed. They need to be addressed and just just watched because the next thing is these things are linked. And just like if you got a line of dominoes, only one of those dominoes will turn over all of them. And if you can get to the front of the line, find the driver, find the weakest link, find the worst, most primitive movement pattern, whatever you want to call it, find the biggest problem, and you will see that working on that somehow either fixes the other or gets them much more ready to change. And the last thing we've got there is it's totally manageable. We This can be done. It's been proven. Any of you guys that have ever done corrective exercise as well know the benefit to somebody's future fitness program if you had not done that as opposed to skipping that step. So, you know, when you can chop and lift to the left and you can't do it to the right, getting that fixed before you do kettlebell swings is a difference that I hope we would never have to measure the alternative. So go ahead. Now, one of the things that that made me very, very proud, but also made me want to keep on this journey is as we've been here and and as we've wondered what the research is going to reveal to us about function, because function, musculoskeletal normal function is such a big component of what we consider wellness and your musculoskeletal risk during activity, is nine of the 16 are captured by doing a functional movement screen or YBT. And what's the first thing we capture? And, and you've been saying this forever. If any of these tests hurt you, game over. We've got something yeah. that we Shocker, can't. pain with movement causes you to have an increase in risk for injury and musculoskeletal health. It does. And most people have been sold the ibuprofen, don't let pain sideline you line for so long that they expect a certain degree of pain. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, what's the difference in pain and stiffness? Stiffness goes away with a little bit of stretching. Pain usually gets worse. So, you know, it, that's, that's the way that is. But what I'm saying is before we worry about what somebody's FMS score is or their single leg stance precision is, if any of these activities hurt, there's an underlying healthcare problem until you prove it's not. Having said that, if you score below the cut on your fundamental movement patterns or on your gate related balance okay your your three dimensional balance that's more than half of the risk factors we're looking at right there so we want your survey we want your lifestyle we want the other non movement things 
But good Lord, there is so much right here we can see in movement that would make us ask even better questions. Well, that again is part of why we wanted to have this conversation right now, Gray, is because too often we're looking at having those things separated. Mm -hmm. most, most trainers, therapists, clinicians – Take the survey and look at that information and say, okay, you've had a previous injury. You've, hey, you got some stress. Well, let's, let's look at that and address that. And not combine and look at these other nine things you're talking about, balance and mobility, stability, and those things. And then some of the people look at just the movement pieces and don't consider those other things. And really, that's the multifactorial that we're talking about is both of these things have to be considered if you want to have good long-term musculoskeletal health. That's where we're kind of getting to. That, that's the combination of these two things that we really need to be considering. And you know what? They're manageable. We can fix them. They, they are. And when, when we look at this, you can go on to the next slide. Um, when we look at this, I think that the, the movement test and screens that we're talking about, and, and we've even got abbreviated versions, versions of those. As a matter of fact, in Athletic Body and Balance 2003, I showed a bunch of self-screens. Those have gone through evolutions that actually make interacting with somebody remotely even easier. Is it as good as having them in the room? No. Is it better than guessing? Heck yeah. So when we look at the, the movement test plus the questionnaire that reveals those other risk factors, Put that in the old thought blender, and you see that red light, green light, yellow light comes out the other side. Go ahead and advance the slide. And this goes back, Gray, to one of our colleagues, Dr. Phil Plisky, looking at movement, combining what the other behavioral risk factors were, and telling you what your injury risk was. And that mood to perform is what it's called, has been researched because, again, it's that algorithm. It's that thought blender that you mentioned that will put you in one of these categories that tells you, hey, you're, if you're at high risk. Now, high risk doesn't mean you're going to get hurt tomorrow. High risk means that if you don't address these underlying issues, the next best thing, the biggest opportunity, you're going to break down. And that's what I want to show. When, when you see us use the simple traffic light system, we've got to protect you from those places you don't belong right now. We've got to correct at that razor's edge of where you can immediately appreciate, become aware, and, and move a little bit better. And we got to develop that which you still got or you already have. So I don't want you to think that any of your clients, patients, athletes gets a single light. I would red light Lee on lunges and overhead presses. I would correct Lee on maybe some core control and balance. Does that mean I can't work out? No, we're working out. Okay. You're just not doing those two I just can't do lunges. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I yeah, don't so, like them anyway. So that's my, my point. I'm not red lighting a human being. I'm red lighting certain activities where it's a little too much to ask, and I can't even fathom the benefit even if we did. So, And that's a very easy concept to explain even for the individual who has high body comp. What do you need to protect them? Where's the red light for them? It's addressing their diet, not telling them all the good things that they need to be putting in their diet. The first order of business is taking away the things they shouldn't be having in their diet. Exactly. And so what I'm going to do over these, these three clients that we've discussed is I'm going to show you almost the simplest way we can have a conversation. And just to penalize myself here, I'm going to try to have all three of these relationships almost remotely, meaning I could look at a few things and at least start this journey. So let's, let's go with the, the first guy. This is my, my hernia guy. And remember, we did some tests where we questioned his balance. We questioned his functional movement patterns or fundamental movement patterns. And if you look at the two tests here, um, and go ahead and advance the slide, the balance and reach is basically just seeing if you can perform single leg stance while advancing the other leg, not touching the floor, two and a half foot lengths in front of you and bringing it back without a loss of balance. The other is, can you squat feet flat deep enough to get your hands to the floor within your footprint front, front to back? Now, these are simply derivatives off of the good old movement screen. They're simply advancements from athletic body and balance. But I could watch these two moves right now over, over Zoom or, or, or Skype or FaceTime and pretty much say, okay, I got a good idea what I'm going to do, and here's what we're going to do with you. You are coming from a hernia. Your red light is we're not doing anything high velocity. Most hernias are repaired with mesh, and that mesh has to pretty much gauge up. So nothing high velocity. Okay, you good with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that because I told you I couldn't swing and I couldn't cut anyway. Great. All right, 
But we're going to run you through a warm-up, and you're going to do a walk immediately after, every day. You're going to walk that golf course anyway, and you're going to be running later. And if you don't walk well, jogging and running aren't in play yet. So advance one more. And what we're going to do is just put him in a, in a movement flow. We're going to challenge his motor control three different ways in three different body positions. We're going to do this, this move that, that Lee was actually doing right here. And, and basically, we're going to go through maybe three spinal positions, a few movement awareness drills. I'm not going to tell him how to do anything. I'm just going to show him these and say, start working on these. Tell me what you're aware of. Give me your feedback. And over the course of a few days, he applies this five to 10 minute warm up in front of the walk that we told him to do. And we start picking up the pace. He might be at a jog in two weeks. But here's the thing. In the time it takes you to watch one of these flows, because we shot these real time and we tested, we tested you, we tested Kyle Barr, we tested Jesse. In the time it took us to shoot these real time, each of you bested your functional movement scores just by warming up in this manner. And there's a little, there's a little secret sauce in here, meaning we know how to put you against yourself. We know how to force you to dig deep for your balance and maybe release some of that tension and get more flexibility. But using these, linked correctives sort of to create awareness breathing control instead of a one station exercise like we used to think we'd get on a machine and just do something that's not the way corrective exercise goes i'm going to make you do a pattern and then i'm going to make you change postures three times and hold that pattern so we're going to assign him based on the two tests i saw in his living room a movement flow and go walk and here's the the thing that we all learn when we learn our Ferns finance course, there's compounding interest. He's only going to move 10% better after this, and he's only going to move 10% better for about a half life of 30 minutes. But if he gets his walk done with a little bit better balance and a little bit better awareness, and he's getting a little bit more brisk each day, and he's sleeping a little better every night because he's dumping that tension, before you know it, he'll be at a jog. And he almost won't even need the warm-up, at which time we can do loads. Let's go to the, the, the next client real quick. Uh, balance, ankle mobility. Okay. Now let's see how she did on the test. There she goes. She actually flunked both of those. And this is a very typical runner's uh, presentation. They, they seem very fit, but they're not very functional. And that, that dysfunction actually puts a ceiling on their advancement as a more proficient runner. So she's actually got ankle mobility and balance problems, but she compensates really well. Make but, it through but, a 5K, not going to make it through a marathon. Right, but one thing you got to bring up for both of these people, there's definitely exercises that are red-lighted, especially for a runner who's got a significant balance problem on the right versus the left. And I think a lot of people will hear us over the years, Grace, say, well, hey, we need to take away running for now. For now. Doesn't mean they can't run forever, but if you're trying to get this person improving their ankle mobility, improving their their um, balance, having their having her run a 5K every day or a 10K like she wants is not going to get you what you need. No, as a matter of fact, I'm going to give her this mobility and 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 stability work right now, and she's going to have to face her balance problems and flexibility problems before every run. And I'm going to do one other thing with her run because 5K is no big deal for her. But I think one of the most uh, really wise people in aerobic fitness right now is Dr. Phil Maffetone, and he has been singing the same song since the 80s. When you are training above your maximum aerobic function, meaning you're, you're basically dipping into that anaerobic, he noticed biomechanics drop right about the same time you leave your nice fat burning metabolism. Now, we all know about interval training and we all know that's how you get gold medals. She ain't going for a gold medal. She's trying to get to the marathon and then she's trying to do well at some later point in the marathon. So here's what I'm doing with her. She's going through these same flows exercise. Hers are more targeted ankle mobility, hip mobility, postural awareness and balance. She's going through this little kata. Every day it's going to get smoother and faster. She's allowed to run, but Dr. Phil Maffetone came up with a really cool formula. It's 180 minus your age, and then we do some adjustability from there, but that puts a roof on her cardio. And The first thing she's going to come back, well, every time I blow past that heart rate, say we got her at 135, I, I can't run at 135, then walk. 
Well, now I drop down to 125, then run, then walk, then run. And what happens is you learn to get a breathing cadence efficiency that over about two weeks of that utter frustration, you're now running further and faster at a lower heart rate than you did starting and stopping. But until we make you start and stop, just like until we make you regain your own balance, you will never be aware that you were doing cardio and an anaerobic situation. And most of us are trying to run at a pace we ran at 18, not at the pace we need to be running now. So I'm going to put a, I'm going to let her run, Lee, but I'm going to put a limit on there that's going to have her walk in half the time until she learns to get a much more efficient gait and use some of the ankle mobility and, and balance that we're giving her each day. Remember, it's an aggregate. 10% compounded every day gets her right where she wants to be in about four to six weeks. And, and Phil Maffetone just did a great podcast with Peter Atia on the drive. And for those of you who don't even know who I'm talking about, brilliant, wise guy who was talking about functional aerobics before you and I were talking about functional screening. So give us the next client. All right. Um. This guy definitely wants to get lean. Let's look at how he did on his uh, functional test. This is single leg stand. All right, he passed both. His balance is good, and his flexibility is is good, meaning I don't see major balance or flexibility problems in him, yet he's got some problems with his... And don't judge a book by its cover. No. Just because someone comes in that doesn't look like they can move very well, prove it. Because a lot of people can't. Whether they're old, young, some people that are very, very fit... Don't move very well. Yeah. Some people who don't look fit, man, you can get through it. Yeah, and, and when you start, and, and I'm sure some of you already do this, when you're looking at stuff through the extra perspectives that we've tried to provide, you don't look at these three people the same way anymore because I thought I had two fit people and one unfit person. What I've got is three unfit people in three different ways. And this guy's actually moving better than them. So I'm going to give him a slightly more challenging movement, but he's got no asymmetries and no major obstacles. So I'm going to actually challenge his balance a little bit better, and that's going to be most of the metabolic he needs. But I'm going to go right back to what where we started this whole musculoskeletal health conversation. It could be that both all of these people have different issues that you got to address through exercise. But they can also have some underlying lifestyle, especially the person who's got to work on their body comp, stress, something going in their life that you've got to address as well. Or they're, Because again, we know that right now we've proven to the research, there are certain things in their lifestyle and the behaviors that will impact their musculoskeletal health, just like we know that certain things in their movements will address their musculoskeletal health. So we've got to make sure that we're dealing with both while they are doing some of these exercises. And and I think that it becomes self-evident. The things that we're red lighting you on are obvious stressors that you don't need to be dealing with. So if we say red light, we're calling that a potential risk or stressor that is unnecessary. And when we're correcting things, it could be hydration, sleep, and portion size on meals. It could be, you know, the type of foods you're eating. It's funny. We've known in nutrition for years now that there's a lot of different ways to consume 500 calories. A couple of beers can do that or a really nice salad with a bunch of, you know, healthy fat on it. Those are 500 calories. So we know the quality of your calorie going in makes a huge difference. It's now time to consider the quality of the calorie going out because inefficient people, functionally challenged people, burn more calories. They also create more cortisol, more pain stress, and more dysfunction. So those 500 calories are actually the ones they're burning are eroding them, not restoring them. And so the quality of movement, the way you burn your calories is equally important as the quality of calories you take in. Exact same amount of exertion, just aimed at your weak link in a constructive way, not at this blind metabolic rate that we think you need to hit to drop weight. Because if you induce stress through that exercise to a point that they can't recover, their rest and regeneration, even though it's good, is actually saying you're not ready for exercise yet. If you watch their heart rate variability, the thing you did on Monday, they're not even ready again until Thursday. I can do this with him on Monday and do it again on Tuesday. Well, one of the things that, that hit me is when I was working at the university 10 years ago, 15 years ago at this point, a lot of the kids, a lot of the athletes get hurt first couple of, years, first couple of weeks, they come back. They return to campus, they get hurt, especially the freshmen. 
Now, the assumption in all these kids are getting hurt because now they're, they're working their bodies harder and they haven't been working out in the offseason. Knowing what I know now, I would argue it's those stressors, those lifestyle. They've changed their life. They've moved away from home. They're having to practice twice a day. They're not eating the way they need to eat. And oh, by the way, most of them have a boyfriend or girlfriend that they left at home. So all that stress that's placed in their bodies could have just as much to do with all those kids getting injured as what they're doing on the field. Isn't it funny that by healthcare definitions, they're healthy, and by fitness definitions in the weight room, they're fit, and by wellness definitions, they're not well. And those three things exist all at the same time. But I do think if we, those, those of you tuning in here and listening, if we hold the line on wellness, we do our movement screens right, we restore movement and don't make a big deal of it, we just get people back on track quicker, the secret in the sauce is taking 10 extra minutes. And everything that you guys would consume in our level one FMS shows you nine out of 16 of those risk factors because you've included the motor control screen in the basic FMS. And, you know, even though we can do this kind of thing remotely, you will get an opportunity to really screen people sometime and be good on that because that's going to dial it in. That's the precision that we hope to get on everybody when we're really dialing in the exercise. Right. We're adding in where you add in the movement piece, you bring in those lifestyle pieces to understand that both of those things, that's the multifactorial piece. Both of those things are what's needed in order for you to make sure they have good musculoskeletal health long term. Now, and, and so as, as, as we're going to uh, wrap this and get to questions, really understand that movement wellness is the fundamentals of functional movement. You wouldn't be here if you didn't appreciate that. And the rest in regeneration regener lifestyle information that most of us, none of the experts disagree on. Now, people are going to disagree over an extra 30 minutes of sleep or not, but most people think seven is better than four. Okay, so let's just be there. There's ways to tell if you're dehydrated, and there's ways to realize you could easily eat calories better. As a matter of fact, uh, one, one more attribute to Maftone. Instead of getting over complex with your diet, just literally cut out carbs for two weeks. When you reintroduce carbs, keep reintroducing them until you have until you feel bad and you just found your limit of carbs. So he gave us two unbelievable ways to control our exercise exertion and, and our consumption. And yet most people would rather read an article than just do a two week test for themselves or actually challenge themselves to do a run and stay under 140 or stay under 130. And it's humiliating. I've, I've done both. And both of them gave me a level of awareness that I'll never lose. And so, you know, I, I don't, never even met the guy. I can't thank him for it. But it was just that piece of advice that, that I applied. And if you guys would look into some of these things and do them in, in whatever resourceful way you can figure out, people are going to talk about what you did for them, just like I talked about what Maffetone gave me some clarity on. And that's the way I want them talking about you because that's, that's the kind of loyalty, that's the kind of business and service we all want to generate. And what I'm saying is, I think we've exhausted a lot of the things in a healthcare model that we know is broken, a fitness model that is blind to some of these risk factors. And if we sit right here at Wellness helping people get from health to fitness with some of these things, these are the stepping stones that will help them cross that and navigate that. And Listen closely. Many people will be stuck in wellness for the rest of their life getting fit the whole time. Okay, You're going to be watching their wellness parameters, their functional mobility and stability. They're never going to get to the get after it fitness that you wish they would, but they're twice as fit as they ever thought they'd be. So wellness looks exactly like fitness with a few more gauges. And healthcare extended a little bit more looks just like wellness with a few more gauges. Yeah, just don't slip back and become unhealthy. Exactly, exactly. And that's what we find. Exercise has created more unhealthy people than healthy people looking at the graph. And that was not their intent going into that endeavor. So uh, guys, we're really trying to put some put some parameters on this. Um, we're very blessed that the the screen is a contributor to this information and any information that comes from looking at movement in a more fundamental way. Remember, you learn to do these patterns before you could talk. And at what time in life is it okay to lose these patterns 
if you want to age gracefully. So that's that's really all it is, standardizing them, creating um, a good objectivity, reliability. That's all the things we obsess on. But simply taking a movement thin slice before we try to change movement gives us a baseline that they'll thank you for later. So, Ashley, see if we got any questions. All right. Thanks, guys. We do have some great questions that came in from the chat box. First, we have from Jennifer Bundo. Uh, some people don't like to hear what they need. Uh, they want to do what they want to do. So they might be insisting doing more interesting workouts and not doing what they need to do. How would you approach that client? Great question. The, the first way is just put cheese on the broccoli and kids eat broccoli. So I can make any corrective look a little more badass fitness than I need to and make it look challenging. But one of the other things, Ashley, uh, that I do is I try to do a quick little uh, movement flow with them and show them how quick their toe touch can change or how quick their balance can change. And then I ask them, if, if you want, let's go do a little sample of what you're talking about. Well, I want to do kettlebell swings. Let's go do them. Come back over. Their balance and toe touch just got worse. So that right there is, I rarely have to do that. But if I did, I would show you how that exercise hurt your state of readiness. And this little thing that seemed not vigorous enough helped your state of readiness. And how can worsening your state of readiness make this exercise session go better. So I've had to go there. I've gone there with a few athletes. I've gone there with a few clients that have been on the internet way more than they've been on the track. So, but, but I, I literally do, I change their movement and then I let them go do something and it sets them right back to where they were. And we measure that too. And most of them go, Oh, wow. And, and it was worth it because we never have this conversation again. So put you at some point, you're going to have to turn what you're saying into action and you need to be prepared to do that. Awareness that you can't rotate as as well to the right as you can to the left. You can't balance on one foot as well on the right as you can to the left. And then saying, hey, this is just going to be part of your plan. It's not going to be the whole thing, but that awareness, I think, is key to get the buy-in. Yep. All right. That was excellent, guys. Um, when it comes to these clients, what's the best way to actually communicate to them their results from their screen? I... Between me and you, and, and I've probably gone 180 from this, I used to think You know, that, you do realize there's more people listening than you two. You said between me and you. <laughs> there's more people here, Gray. Oh, really? <laughs> I thought it was just, I thought we were just doing this on a Thursday. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, well, you, you broke my train of thought, <laughs> thanks, blew. Lee. Go get me a cup of coffee. <laughs> no, but it, well, if you're looking at the, the question about the FMS results, I, I think you don't want to – nobody cares about their movement screen. Let's be honest. Yeah. The, the, the individual doesn't care. No, and, and, and uh, I, I'm, that's where I was going with that. When I movement screen them, I don't tell them where the movement screen came from or what it does. I said, based on what I just saw, these are the exercises that are going to help you the most, the quickest. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you the test that we're going for. And I'll show them a toe touch or a leg raise or single leg stance. We'll run through a mini sample of the corrective and they will actually look at me and go, oh my goodness, that's better. And I'm like, exactly. And that's what your test told me to do. And so I think a lot of people to, to pay respect to functional movement systems, try to educate people on functional movement. Please don't take them right to where they need to be. Use, use the protect, correct, give them the corrective, please establish uh, an improvement in the baseline. Cause if, if your corrective isn't changing things, then I would say just practice correctives a little bit more, or pick an easier client at first. But the minute you have a really good skill set of changing movement, and believe me, I did it a lot before I ever walked out on stage and changed the toe touch in front of 300 people because it could have gone wrong. But once you have that experience and confidence, you will say, based on your test, the survey and some of the other things we talked about, I want to try these moves with you. They will look like you just handed them the best meal they ever had. And uh, I'd like to say it like this. If you sat with a world-class chef with a Michelin rating and told them the types of foods you like, they'd come out and give you the best meal you ever had because that's how they're listening. That's what we need to become. So they didn't tell me what they did in the kitchen. They listened to me. They read some of my signals, and they handed me something I would have never designed for myself and then showed me in my own report that's better. And so having a few good correctives at your disposal and then letting them go back through the test that sent you there, 
don't tell them there's a difference. They'll probably tell you first. 80-20 play. Is it 100%? No. And the better you get, the closer you are to 80-20. Okay, keeping in line with the theme of communication, how do you communicate risk factors or their risk factors like to the client themselves in a positive way? It's opportunity. Yeah. That's a simple, that's a simple. Everybody coming in wants to know, how do I achieve my goals? In order to achieve your goals, whether you want to be a better basketball player, golfer, you want to just lose some weight, here's the best place for us to start. It, the best place for us to start, hey, let's monitor your sleep. I notice you're not sleeping very well. Let's monitor your sleep for the next week. Let's make sure you're getting a good eight hours of sleep. Let's make sure you're drinking enough water. That's the best place for us to start that's going to give us the biggest opportunity for improvement so you can achieve your goals. So it's not about, hey, shit, you, you've got pain with five movements. What are we going to do? No. Hey, we've got to clean these things up so you can do a little bit better and you achieve your goals. And, and one of the ways I've tried to start talking is when you do have movement issues, like a little worse flexibility on one side, a little poor balance on the other side, or you hadn't touched your toes in three years, what people need to understand is when your body has a few extra kinks in it or instabilities or all the stress of exercise goes to one area. It's not evenly distributed across the tissues. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time <laughs> getting the wrinkles out because when we do go a little bit more vigorous in exercise, it won't feel any harder than what we're doing today. And so we're going to have this nice, easy transition into a much fitter place. But if it, the, the story of the tortoise and the hare is right there, ever present, most of us think we're a rabbit. Just trudge along like the turtle. You'll do just fine. But most of us don't want to admit that. And, and now we have evidence that says not only should we admit that, let's watch it change. Once we know where the baseline is, it moves quicker by taking this approach. But all the stress of your exercise is going to accumulate in your low back because your hamstrings are so tight and your abs are so weak. So let's spend a little extra time getting them integrated, not isolated. I want your hamstrings and abs to work better together. And before you know it, we're not going to have an accumulation of stress in your low back. And so I want exercise to evenly stress your body, not to have local micro trauma accumulation in one compensation segment or high stress area. All right. This next one comes in from David Orsini. Uh, I have a client who is asymmetrical in their shoulders. There have been so many mobility drills that FMS have to offer that are great, but what are some good practices to maintain stability as in mobility? You know, this is a, if, if you've done some correctives and even though that issue was there, if it's, if it's not painful, but it, it, you'd have to do a lot of correct. Here's the situation we usually see, unless I keep doing correctives, it goes back. Well, that's a great time to try one new thing in programming. And when I've had shoulders that sort of get better with corrective but start sliding backward, I do something like a Turkish getup, but I break it down. Uh, Brett Jones and I broke it down and turned it into seven different movements. But usually the stability and function that you want to reinforce in the workout happens for the shoulder in a 3D way in a posturally correct way because you think about it you go from flat on your back to standing the whole time never lifting anything with your shoulder simply staying stable and in in sort of a good kinetic balance with that so i don't care whether you start with a shoe on your foot or two pound uh kettlebell it doesn't matter transitioning from a corrective like chop and lift or or some of those other shoulder mobility stability things we do into something very practical like a turkish get up um, is is a great sort of intermediate before we get into overhead pressing swings bench pressing you know clean stuff like that so the turkish get up is humbling to both stiff people and strong people but learning how to breathe and move and and many of the cues that we hear good yoga instructors do that's what i'm bringing to the turkish get up are you symmetrical does this feel the same way don't try to stand up just try to achieve the next posture with elegance and simplicity and usually it's not something you expect to be good at in two weeks i think i was on it for six weeks before brett jones gave me the nod so well, I, th I think one thing one thing uh, real quick on that, Gray, is what you're alluding to or getting to is too often people who say they have shoulder mobility problems only focus on the upper body. They may be giving somebody a great thoracic spine mobility, 
But what you're talking about with the Turkish getup is you're integrating. Because shoulder mobility may be a problem or out because an underlying issue somewhere else in the body. So by syncing everything up with a movement like the Turkish getup, that's where it becomes ingrained in the, in the brain a little bit better. So you're not just, quote unquote, isolating out the upper body and shoulders. You're syncing everything together. And I think that's something people miss. Yeah. And, and what, are the, what are the obvious things? If you've got an anatomical asymmetry, you've got somebody who's been throwing for, for 25 years, they're going to have some natural structural asymmetry that you're not going to get rid of. You're going to have people, if they're constantly complaining of a little bit of neck pain or I get my neck gets stuck two or three days a week, yeah, these there's a good reason why these shoulders aren't coming along. So if you've got a, a biomechanical problem in the shoulder, neurological problem in the neck, um, or a structural problem from an injury or a lot, a lot of repetitive motion, then those people are going to be outliers. But if you're just having somebody who's had years of shoulder stiffness, maybe some inappropriate training, correctives are working, but not not impressively enough. Now it's time to transition from those correctives to a workout, as Lee said, that makes you use your shoulder with everything, not just in isolation. And and I think that if you rule out those other uh, extenuating circumstances, you'll find that uh, a large percentage of the time, the Turkish getup becomes something that's in the playbook for this person the rest of their life. And, and part of the theme we talked about today, Gray, is don't just look at the exercise look at the lifestyle. What are they doing outside of the hour, three days a week that you may see them or they may work out that could be making their shoulders worse far and that doesn't allow you to get better. Yeah. So address that as well. Yeah. You ask the question, you find out, oh yeah, I rented a jackhammer last month. I'm breaking up my own driveway. Ah, uh, <laughs> so you, you never know what you'll hear on the other side of those questions. All right. Thanks guys. Uh, lastly, the subjects who were in that military uh, study that you mentioned, what kind of individuals were they? What were the, what was their rank? The military studies, most of them that we reference uh, are general population. So general military. I mean, there's, there's definitely been some studies um, with different groups. But the ones that we talk about when we look at musculoskeletal health and what Dr. Kyle Kiesel and Dr. Phil Plisky were doing was looking at more just general population military. And I think that's what I think we need to understand is, you know, the military at the large level, you have cooks, you have attorneys, you have um, a lot of desk workers. And a lot of times we don't realize that. So they're very much comparable to just the general population. And that's who we were looking at. And we've got all these things referenced. Uh, so you can certainly take a look at that and dive deeper into some of that research. You know, it's 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 really good because, you know, a lot of people hear military and they think way on the high end of tactical and special ops. And even though we've had exposure and experience there, what Lee's saying is the general population of the military is a good cross-section of Americana. And the only reason that we can talk uh, more confidently about their representation than America is the fact that we got better record keeping over there. Yeah. Most, most personal trainers, physical therapists, chiropractors uh, don't communicate in the way that they're forced to on a, on a military base. Uh, and we can keep better records. But I honestly think if we started watching some of these metrics, we could accomplish some of the same things that we probably can and have accomplished in a little bit tighterly regulated environments. All right. Thank you so much, guys. We are done with questions today, but do you have any last comments or statements to make? Lee bought me this shirt for Christmas because he thought I was going to wear a sleeveless workout shirt today. Um, I'm, I'm shocked he's got sleeves on today. Um, I don't think we'll see that very often. When, when we start, when we get back doing the podcast, you guys check out season three. I'm sure he will not be wearing a collared shirt. So all you guys that just saw us for the first time, you should be impressed. He did this for you, the YouTube live crowd. So um, I appreciate it to a degree. Um <laughs> But that's not the norm. But thank you guys for tuning in, um, whether you watched it live or watching it uh, some other time. I think the big thing that you're going to see, again, a theme from us moving forward is just making sure we're looking at these risk factors in a different way and addressing them a little bit better. Because right now, exercise is becoming just as much of a problem as uh, – as some of these other things. And we've got to realize we've got to do a better job. I'll give you one, one personal thing. The, the last few years, I've really been trying to gather information, create an experience, and then have really good objective reflection on that. And what I really encourage you guys to do is 
you got to go and get screened yourself. You got to go through some corrective strategies yourself. Lee and I have pretty much been through most of the programs we've done for the different problems we've had across our life, orthopedic issues and whatnot. And I just think there's a different level of integrity when you consume the product that you're also discussing with your clients and patients and athletes. So, you know, with all the interruptions we've had in our normal schedule with COVID, there's absolutely no excuse why two therapists can't find a half hour and screen each other and openly discuss exercise, SFMA, two chiropractors, two trainers, two strength coaches, whatever. We've got to apply this personally. And I think what you're going to come on the other side of that is that experience, that personalization is going to help you be a little bit more eloquent in the way you talk about it. Because I think the only advantage we have isn't our degree and isn't our education. It's the time in the trenches we've had of, you know, trying to back up functional statements and then do stuff. So screen yourself, work out your own problems, screen somebody who's not paying you, help them. And then before you know it, you're doing this like a pro, like you do everything else. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, we wanted to let you know that there will be a email coming to you in your inbox at the, by the end of the day today with more information about our FMS education as well as what's coming in 2021. Um, you can always find us on our social media channels. We are on Twitter, Facebook, as well as Instagram at Functional Movement. That's MVMT for movement. Um, and then the podcast can also be found at, at Movement Pod. Uh, please remember from our podcast team, we actually also love when you rate and review uh, the show and it, it really helps other people get to know that uh, we're out there on that platform as well and you can listen to us. Um, we have season three coming soon, so stay tuned for that. But thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. That's it for today. Please share this video with your colleagues, friends, and family, or anyone who you think may learn something from it. And on behalf of everyone at FMS, thank you again. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you soon. Remember, move well and then move often.